Now let's take a look at a couple examples of using uh, and using the fundamental theorem of calculus here. So for example here, modeling data experimental vehicle is tested on a straight track. It starts from rest and velocity v in meters per second is recorded every 10 seconds for one minute. Okay, so here we have our data. In order to make sense of the data, we're going to use our graphing calculators to get a cubic equation. So that would be, you know, ax to the third plus bx squared plus cx plus d. We're looking for that. Okay, and that's where you do your regression model on your calculator to come up with that equation. Then sketch it on a graph, just a, a, a sketch, just to get an idea of what it looks like. Uh, I know it goes t from 0 to 60, but just get an idea of what it looks like, um, and then approximate the distance traveled, and this part is where you're going to use integration, the fundamental theorem of calculus, to find that total distance traveled, because you notice you're given the velocity uh, in terms of time t. All right, so uh, remember... If you're plugging these in, these will be your your dependent variables, and your t, which is time, would be your independent variable. So plug them in appropriately. So try this. So pause the video, try this, and come back and see how you did. So let's see how you did on this one. Plugging that into your regression um, statistics regression equation, you get the velocity is... This, negative 0 0.00086t to the third plus 0.0782t squared minus 0.0208t plus 0 0.10. Again, we don't need that plus c. And when you sketch that graph, it looks something like what we see here. Uh, my windows are from 0 to 90 on your y-axis and from 0 to 70 on your x-axis just to give us an idea of what we're doing. And so you can see what we're going to end up doing is finding that area. Uh, but it actually only goes out to 60. So your area only goes out to 60, not 70 here. All right, let me fix that. So this should be 60. And we're finding that area under the curve from 0 to 60. So we set up our in integral. You have your limits of integration, 0 to 60. And when you integrate these, each individual uh, term, you add 1, divide by 4, add 1, divide by 3, add 1, divide by 2, add 1, and that would just be V, or I guess T is our independent there. Okay, and that's what we have right here. Now, you have your upper minus lower. When you plug 60 in there, you can keep that in your calculator and just plug 60 in. Um, might take some time there. But to save time, you can think, hey, when I plug my lower limit in, whatever this is, it's going to be minus 0. So really, you just have to worry about what is my answer when I plug in my upper limit. And when you simplify that, it would be approximately 2,476 meters. Okay, so for this case, we answered the question. Let me go back up to the question. Okay, we how far did it move uh, during this test that the vehicle took measure when we're measuring the velocity with uh, time intervals? Okay, and so that's the total that it moved was the 2,476 meters during those 60 seconds. Looking at the second fundamental theorem of calculus is very, very, very similar um, to what we have done. But now when you integrate, uh, you have uh, as your limits variables. So sometimes you could have variables as limits like right here. This is what we just did. And now this is different because now there is an x as your upper limit. That is an unknown where a and b are usually your constants, your limit of integration. So now what if we don't know what that upper limit is, but we know what the total area is? Well, now we can set it up to figure out what that upper limit has to be for, the, for it to be equal to a specific area. Right, so we're setting it up as like this says an integral um, as a function of x. So let's take a look at an example. What does this mean? 
When we integrate from 0 to x cosine of t, the integral of cosine, sine, so from here to there, so you would have then the sine of x, and that's from 0 to x. And if we keep going from there, you'd plug in your, oh, sorry, that'd be the sine of t here. Forgot we switched that variable. Now, when I plug in my upper, minus lower, you would have then the sine of x, because that's my upper, minus the sine of 0, because that's my lower, which is then just the sine of x, since the sine of 0 is 0, thinking back to your unit circle. Now, this is my function, all right? That's my integral in terms of a function, as a function. Now when I plug in, you want to know what is f of 0, what is f of pi over 6, and you're plugging all of these in there for x. Okay, go ahead and finish those. You're plugging pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2, and don't forget 0 in. Pause the video and come back and see how you did all up um, and you plug those values in for sine. So the sine of 0, uh, well we already did that there, but the sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 6 is 1 half and sine of pi over 4 is radical 2 over 2. Again, um, review your unit circle if you're struggling with this. And the sine of pi over 3 is radical 3 over 2. And the sine of 1 half is just 1. Okay, so we made it into a function and evaluated different parts of that. That's what the second fundamental theorem of calculus um, talks about. And so let's look at a, another example here using the second fundamental theorem of calculus, this definition. Well, let's just look at what this definition is because it will help us on the next problem that we already know. But again, with the second fundamental theorem, it's instead of constants, if you have a variable up there and you notice you're taking the derivative with respect to the variable in your limits, not the variable that is in your integral there. Okay, that's a very important distinction that the integral in the derivative will simplify out and it will be in terms of your upper limit just like what we did up here this became in terms of instead of instead of t it became in terms of the sine of x which is what we were looking for all right so looking and applying that understanding here so if we have the derivative of this integral we know again our upper limit is x and we're finding the derivative with respect to x then that means that we have to have our answer in terms of um here it is in terms i need that there we go in terms of x so these will cancel each other out the x will go in there right and you would have your upper minus your lower so you would have, plug in your upper, that would be x squared plus 1. Since your lower limit is 0, the minus the lower limit will cancel. Here, this part's tricky, right? I have to take that times 1 because we changed that variable. All right, now listen carefully. This right here... Okay, I multiply by the derivative of what I plugged in. Okay, so since my upper limit was x, that would be times the derivative of x, which is just 1. Okay, then minus, when I plug in 0... 0 squared plus 1 times the derivative of what I plugged in, and I plugged in 0. Well, the derivative of 0 is 0, okay? Uh, and so that's why it's times 0. So you will, if you're 
have a constant in the bottom, you'll never have to worry about this second part because it will always be zero. Now, when we simplify this, you would have the square root of x squared plus one, and then that is, using the second fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, our answer for this particular question. So let's look at an example of where that upper limit is not just x, right? Because when we plug in x to the third, okay, when we plug in x to the third, we're finding the derivative, right? So it's going to be d over dx. If we set this up, pi over 2, 2x to the third, and cosine, well, cosine of t dt. Okay, now when we plug in that upper limit, because we know the derivative of this function is just cosine, but we're going to plug in our upper limit minus the lower limit. And remember, since it's with respect to dt, but we're going to plug in a different variable, that's why we have to multiply it by the derivative of what we plugged in. So, so just try this. Uh, on your own to kind of see how you do and then come back to the video and check your answer. So when we go ahead and do that, we're going to plug x to the third in and multiply by the derivative of x to the third because we're changing the variable uh, and you have to account for that. And then you would plug in pi over 2 times the derivative of pi over 2, which again, it doesn't have a variable in it, so it just becomes 0. And then when you simplify it, you get 3x to the third times cosine of x squared. A way that I've seen it put in general terms that can be applied to pretty much anything in your lower and upper, because sometimes your lower won't be a constant. Sometimes it'll be a function, just like your upper is a function. So if u and v represent functions, it's the same thing. So it would be f of your upper function times the derivative of your upper function minus f of your lower function times the derivative of your lower function, whatever those functions uh, would be. Okay, so this is what this is kind of a statement that will work and help you figure out if your upper and lower limits are anything other than x or a constant. That is it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed.